Okay, today we're going to get through a whole chunk of Unit 10, which is primarily going to focus on liquids and solids. Okay, we, this is why we kind of group together um, gases, liquids, and solids for the purposes of this unit. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is intra versus intermolecular forces. And we overgeneralize by throwing molecular here, but um, that's just the way it is. Now, intramolecular forces are forces that are within molecules and um, this is where I mean we overgeneralize because in a minute here you're going to also talk me talk let, hear me talk about the fact that we also categorize ionic bonding and metallic bonding as intramolecular but the whole thing is that they are inside molecules and they're what hold atoms together now intermolecular forces is between different molecules and these are the forces that get weaker as phase changes go from solids, liquids, to gas. Okay, these are the ones where um, we're not uh, changing something, we're just how, how well are these things held together completely. And this is showing you with the arrows. And when the substance changes state, the molecule stays together, but the intermolecular forces will weaken or strengthen depending on if they are gaining energy or losing energy and they're able to overcome those. Now, as a just as a little quick review, the, the types of forces that we would consider to be intramolecular are covalent, ionic, metallic. These are much, much, much stronger, meaning it would take a lot more energy to break these types of forces. Whereas intermolecular forces occur only between different molecules which contain um, covalent bonds. I think there's a little bit of writing here, maybe this part that's not, um, may or may not be in your notes. So, And the ones that fall into this category are dipole-dipole interactions, hydrogen bonding, and London dispersion forces. And for dipole-dipole interactions to occur, um, we're going to talk about this, but this is pretty much these two only happen for substances that are polar. So all this geometry stuff that we did and identifying if things are polar or not, these two right here are going to be polar. London dispersion, dispersion forces are technically present everywhere, but they are um, the only ones present in nonpolar, and we're going to talk a little more about that. Okay, dipoles. Um, a dipole moment, again, is just when something has polarity to it. That's it. Okay, so for example, this molecule right here is polar. And these, when we have a dipole moment, these molecules line up so that they minimize their repulsion and maximize the attraction. Or in other words, the positives and the negatives line up so that they're kind of opposite from each other. And these are extremely weak compared to covalent and ionic bonds. Now, hydrogen bonding is really just a special type of polarity. Um, it's, a, it's the same type of chemistry for dipole-dipole, except it's only going to happen between hydrogen and the three most electronegative elements, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And it's a very strong type of dipole-dipole force, and it usually happens because the bond is extremely polar because these atoms are so small. And water is by far the best example. We'll actually watch another video in class by another instructor um, who does a great job of explaining polarity of hydrogen, or excuse me, of water and what that leads to. And this is just showing you, this is boiling points right here, and we use, are going to use boiling points and melting points as a reflection of how strong these forces are. And you'll notice where you have water, hydrofluoric acid, and ammonia have much higher boiling points than most of these other compounds, um, covalent compounds, and it's strictly because the hydrogen bonding is so strong and it occurs with those particular atoms. All right, London dispersion forces are technically present all the time. However, they're only important for nonpolar molecules and noble gas atoms that do not have dipole-dipole and they do not have hydrogen bonding. Okay, so they're present all the time, but the only time we have to look at them are when they're nonpolar molecules. And essentially what happens is they're very weak, short-lived attractive forces that are caused by these formations of temporary dipoles simply because of the fact Whoa. that the electron is moving around the molecule. So for example, here you have diatomic hydrogen, which we would consider as it being nonpolar, right? Well, over here, you get an instantaneous dipole simply because, and we look at hydrogen because you're only talking about two electrons. Well, let's say in their movement, 
all of a sudden they both end up on one side of the molecule and that's kind of what this is shown over here where you get this this is an electron dot map well as soon as you get this separation to charge this molecule is going to influence this molecule since this is positive it's going to attract the electrons over on this side and so this is kind of like stage one stage two in stage three of inducing what's called a temporary dipole moment. But then as fast as they move and shift, they're moving back and then they're repelling each other and, and they're kind of off and running. So it's this constant cycle, but they're very, 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 very weak. Okay, only important for nonpolars and noble gases. And again, this is just showing you all the different hydride compounds where you have um, the Hydrogen bonding one's the strongest. Everything else is kind of in the midst. And then, you know, with methane, methane is one of the only nonpolar molecules that's on this one, and its boiling point is so much lower because the forces, I mean, you know, almost 200 degrees lower when you compare it to water. And because the, it only has London dispersion, these guys up here have hydrogen bonding, and these guys out here most of them, without going into too much detail, have dipole-dipole. And that's also a ranking of how strong these are. Hydrogen is the strongest, dipole-dipole is the second, London dispersion is the third. AP loves to ask questions about this on the AP test, and we'll do lots of practice on these. Which gets us to this one. Which one has the highest boiling point? Hydrofluoric, and because it has hydrogen bonding, that's why hydrofluoric would have the highest boiling point or the highest melting point. Now, if we had to identify the most important intermolecular forces, barium sulfate would be ionic, hydrogen sulfide, dihydrogen sulfide would be dipole-dipole because it's a polar bond, xenon would be London dispersion, it's a nonpolar noble gas. Our, we would also have London dispersion for this hydrocarbon, Again, no polarity to it, okay, because there's no lone pairs and the carbon and hydrogen bond is not a polar bond. And then phosphorus in its elemental form would also be London dispersion, it's nonpolar. Then you've got water, which is going to have hydrogen bonding, which again is just a type of dipole dipole. And then we've got one more ionic comp compound with cesium iodide. Okay, so which one has the stronger IMFs? Carbon dioxide, it's nonpolar, um, only has London dispersion. The OCS molecule is polar, so it's dipole-dipole. I think it's going to bring all these up and then circle them. Nope, okay. So on this one, um, stronger IMFs, here's our polar here. Um, PF3 is going to be polar, so that one's stronger. You've got your sulfur difluoride right here, which is polar, and then your sulfur dioxide. So it's just being able to compare. Um, based on, really based on the Lewis structure, and we're going to tie all that together again in this unit as well. Okay, liquids, properties of liquids. They have low compressibility, no rigidity, meaning that they are fluid. They have very high density compared to gases. Um, huge jump between gases and liquids, small jump between liquids and solids. Um, they will bead up as droplets. That's where we get kind of this water. Um, beads down here, and that is due to surface tension. Um, res resistance to an increase in the surface area. Greater tension means stronger IMFs, just really right on the surface. It, they kind of like pull each other in just a little bit more and kind of tighten up and ball up around the outside. Um, additional special properties, capillary action is the spontaneous rising of a liquid of a tube. It's due to the cohesive forces between the liquid and the container. This is why when we read a meniscus or a eudometer tube or a bure, you're going to get this um, kind of curvature because all the liquid on the outside is being pulled up the side of the tube. And then viscosity is going to be a measure of a liquid's resistance to flow. Um, if they have strong IMFs, it's going to be extremely viscous. Large complex molecules will also be highly viscous simply because it takes more energy to, for them to move around each other. So those are going to be situations that you have high levels of viscosity as well. Okay, that's going to be it for 10.1 and 10.2, and then we'll do 10.3 here in just a few minutes.